I'm going to talk to you guys about tradition. Now, if I could just start out this way, tradition is, they're easy to make. It's common for us to kind of work ourselves into familiar rhythms that become a normal part of our life. It feels safe. Like traditions feel safe. They feel, they're, they're our comfort go-to spot. Um, just giving you guys an example right at the front, okay? Um, when you come into being married and you're starting your own family or you have children or whatever, you start to wonder if the traditions you grew up under is something that you should initiate in your own home, something that you should do. Now, um, my wife, at the very beginning stages of our relationship and marriage, made it abundantly clear that she had no desire to be any part of Valentine's Day. Now, knowing um, stuff, I'm, I'm not going to go any further than that, knowing stuff, I thought, it's a trap. Um, and I'm just like, oh, I don't know what to do. So, obviously, that first Valentine's Day, I bought her something nice. I mean, that was smart. She got irritated. And I'm like, I bought you a bracelet, a pretty one. And um, the bracelet sat on the, you know, jewelry thingy um, for a while. And then the next year, I'm like, okay, she's saying it again. <laughs> you know, and then it became like over the next few years, it became like this struggle, like, okay, I've got a one up or something like that. Maybe if I get a bigger gift or something, um, it'll appease her. And um, it did not. And, and in fact, it made her increasingly frustrated, <laughs> which is bizarre because women enjoy being shown affection through gifts. Don't, I, shut up, Seth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the following year, though, I decided to do something very different, very, um, and it was like a last minute thing, and perhaps that was a good thing because it initiated a new tradition, but it was about four days before Valentine's Day, and, and I thought, okay, I'm not going to get her a gift this year, um, just forget it, you know, because she doesn't want a gift, and then it's like three days before Valentine's Day, and I'm like, what did you do? I was like freaking out, so I'm like, okay, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, okay, I'm going to go back to like six, seven years old, I'm going to make her something, okay, I'm going to make her like a really corny card or something like that, so um, I sat down and I started panicking. Um, at the time, there wasn't Pinterest, so um, I couldn't just like cool, um, you know, put to, or you know, craft ideas for Valentine's Day. And so I made her this like really, really corny card and all this stuff. It was made out of construction paper, cut out hearts, you know, use some crayons. And I thought, okay, this is terrible. And it was amazing. She like loved it. Absolutely adored it. And so, um, you know, after I walked around the house for a little bit, kind of puffed up and saying, yep, that's right. Not letting her know that it took place three days before when I panicked. Um, it initiated a new tradition. Okay, it started something fresh. And so every year since then, I make her something. Every year since then, I try to put my hands to building something. Now, last, this last two years, Grace and Liberty were kind of like watching me put something together. And, and they're like, whoa, you know, was this kind of last minute? And I've said, yeah, I've been thinking, I've been thinking about it for the last couple of weeks um, and planning it. And they don't know that planning it or thinking it is actually thinking about what am I going to do for Valentine's Day. Um, and, I, you know, I've come up with some pretty cool ideas on the night before. <laughs> Anyhow, and traditions have a way of becoming an important part of our culture, and they, they um, invade our families, they invade our personal lives, they become, um, you know, something that we're familiar with, and, and so much so that we don't know how to live normal without them. I mean, I can remember traditions at Christmas time or Easter or different holidays or special days during the year where you would feel like we've got to do something specific because that's the way we've always done it. And, you know, that can cause some problems. Now, our community 
exhibits them. Our relationship uh, circles exhibit them. Our family dynamic is filled with them. And this morning, for obvious reasons, I'm going to talk to you about church. Now, don't misunderstand me because sometimes, um, you know, we, we get up here, pastors that are trying to do something new and fresh, they immediately start taking target at traditions and talking about how horrible all of them are. But if I were to make a a statement about this, I would say that tradition impacts our family, our communities, and our churches. Now, tradition has the power to enrich our faith. It is also tradition that has the spiritual power to rot away the lining of the fabric of our faith. I hope you understand what I'm saying there. Either negative or positive, the effects cannot be over-exaggerated. Tradition is significant. Tradition can empower our faith. It can enrich our faith. It can increase our development of understanding God and His nature. Or it can cause serious issues when we get stuck in wrong rhythms and we battle for things that are not connected to Scripture but connected to human perspective. Just bringing it out a little bit. A good tradition is significant. Good tradition creates uh, strong roots and strengthens our stance. Good tradition stabilizes faith. Good tradition points us toward a better future. But bad tradition has some implications. Bad tradition stunts growth and suppresses development. Bad tradition trips us up in insignificant details. Bad tradition blurs our sights of the future. So there's a strong difference between good traditions and bad traditions. And we've got to make that distinction. When we're talking about bad religion, we need to recognize that there are certain traditions that we carry with us over generation to generation that actually begin to alienate culture. Our culture's changing. I'm not suggesting that we allow the world to invade our church and invade our ministries and cause us to lower our standards and our convictions. But what I am saying is there are certain methods that we have got to be willing to adjust. I'm not saying that we should never, would I say, that we budge on Scripture. What I am saying, though, is that we have got to caution ourselves. Jesus was especially frustrated with the religious leaders who had taken God's word and added a bunch of stuff to it, making it overcomplicated. In Colossians 2, 8, and then jumping from 13 to 23, it says this, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers or the spiritual principles of this world, rather than from Christ. As for us, as for us, we can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, we are always thankful that God chose you to be among the first or chose you from the very beginning to experience salvation, a salvation that came through the Spirit who makes you holy and through your belief in the truth. He called you to salvation when we told you the good news. Now you can share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. With all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and keep a strong grip on the teaching or traditions that we passed on to you both in person and by letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud and they are not connected to Christ. 
the head of the body, for he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. They're taking target. Jesus, or the the disciples are, are taking target of all these different methods that the Pharisees and the Sadducees put together. Remember when we talked about this in our first week, we talked about how they had specific um, laws about how to wash the kettles. They had specific laws about how to wash your hands, to make sure your hands were fully cleansed. The, the, the disciples are taking target. Paul is taking target at the issue with human teaching that does not satisfy us and does not bring us to the place that he desires. It's no way to conquer our evil desire. You see, the Bible portrays man-made traditions as bad when, when um, they are bad when they are bound on others without grace. They are bad when they, are, when they become greater uh, point of our devotion than true worship to God. They are bad when they are taught as commandments. They, were, they are bad when they are uh, superseding what is clearly written, divinely inspired commandments of God. And see, tradition is a good thing in churches. Traditionalism, though, is the problem. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Catch that, okay? Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. It's traditionalism that gives tradition a bad name. It is traditionalism that gives tradition a bad name. So we can decide. We can decide what our ancestors say about our faith now. I understand that there are prominent individuals that we read about and we discover as we study and understand faith more, but we have got to caution ourselves that we do not attach things to the message and attach things to the truth that we abide by. In Colossians 2, uh, 18, in the message translation, it says this. Don't tolerate people who try to run your life, ordering you to bow and scrape, insisting that you join their obsession. They're a lot of hot air. That's all they are. They're completely out of touch with the source of life, Christ, who puts us together in one piece, whose very breath and blood flow through us. He is the head and we are the body. We can grow up healthy in God only as He nourishes us. In verse 22, I don't have it up there, but in verse 22 and 23 in the message it says, do you think, do you think things that are here today and gone tomorrow are worth that kind of attention? Such things Um, sound impressive if said in deep enough voice. They even give the illusion of being pious and humble and ascetic. But, or aesthetic, but they're just another way of showing off, making yourselves look important. And in saying that, tradition is not an expletive, 
Okay, tradition is something that enriches our faith. Tradition is something that increases our understanding. The appropriate traditions. Let me give you an example, okay? I know that it speaks about this in Scripture, but tradition has become baptism. That's a tradition of our faith. It's something that has empowered our faith, and it is something that Scripture has communicated to us that we do as we become believers in Jesus. Tradition is taking communion together, understanding that the cup and the bread signify his death and resurrection. Tradition are the things that we celebrate. Now, I understand that we should celebrate the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus all year long, but there are certain dates that we um, focus on those things. Tradition is incredibly important. However, the church can be morally overbearing and communicatively communicatively dry and spiritually confusing. There are churches that I have grown up in in my life that were overwhelming with with words that were confusing to me. Now, in, in our study of faith, we may discover what words like propitiation mean and words like you know, um, salvation in our culture might even be confusing. Or, you know, um, uh, sovereignty may be a word that's kind of confusing. Now, we should discover those words and learn to understand those words, but that is just a a part of people becoming um, separate because they don't understand certain rhythms that we practice. They're afraid that if they come into the church and they don't do things a certain way, they are going to not not just not fit in, but they're not going to be good enough for God. They, they fear that they won't be good enough for God. Well, you know, and I know that um, things are, are different in um, North Country, but when I was in, in different places in Ohio, um, if you didn't wear your suit to church, who, who were you? Why are you not giving God your best? You know what? I don't have $250 to buy a suit or $100 to buy a suit. And I could buy one off of Amazon for $60, but God knows it ain't going to fit. You know, it's going to be too tight or too big. I'm just going to muddle around in it with my, in hopes that my pants don't fall down to my ankles at the wrong time. We've got to be careful. We've got to begin to see traditionalism as a manipulation that hijacks our opportunity for real joy. Okay, listen to me for a second. Tradition is delightful. Tradition is exciting. As silly and corny as it is, making a gift every Valentine's Day for my wife is something that I thoroughly enjoy. It is exciting. If I were to just get on whatever online site and try to find some pretty um, decorative thing to ornament her with, honestly, and give it to her, I would probably not find a whole lot of joy in that because she doesn't have a whole lot of joy in that. If we're not careful, tradition begins to become a manipulation, an attempt to be just right, an attempt to be perfect, an attempt to fit in, to, uh, um, an attempt to be crammed into a mold and a manipulation that will bring us no real joy. When you belong to a ministry or a movement that is largely based on tradition, you feel like you've got to step into a place of certain requirements or a place where you have to fit this mold. And if you don't fit this mold, you're not good enough. So what does that do? It rots you on the inside. It removes hope. It removes joy. It removes peace. Why? Because you will never do the traditions good enough. So where do you stand? What do you do? What do you do? You find the balance. We've also got to understand that tradition discloses the dynamic realities of God's kingdom. Not traditionalism, but tradition. I know that it seems like I'm jumping in two contrary places. It might appear as though I'm slamming tradition and then then also talking about how tradition is a good thing. We've got to take a look at it with real perspective of what the Scripture says, church. We have got to target tradition 
that is not healthy, that is not good, that has been carried from generation to generation that becomes overbearing, a burden to carry, as opposed to an exciting thing to experience. In Matthew eleven fifteen through 19, and then 25 through 30, this is Jesus speaking. I'm going to read it in the message. It says, are you listening to me? Really listening? How can I account for this generation? The people have been like spoiled children whining to their parents. Hmm. Um, Anyway, I'm not going to go there. Um, We wanted to skip rope and you were always too tired. We wanted to talk, but you were always too busy. John came fasting and they called him crazy. I came feasting and they called me lush, a friend of riffraff. Opinion polls don't count for much, do they? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Abruptly, I've had some nasty pudding, so I can attest to that. Abruptly, Jesus broke into prayer. I love this. He's just like, oh wait, hold on, pause a minute. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've concealed your ways from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but spelled them out clearly to ordinary people. Yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given all, me all these things to do and to say. This is a unique father-son operation, coming out of the father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm not keeping it to myself. I love that. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. That's an indication that religion in that day was overwhelming. That is an indication that religion in that day was, was, was heavy, was a burden. But he's saying right there, Jesus is saying, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? I love the idea that grace becomes an unforced rhythm in our life where we begin to discover by grace, by the grace of God daily, as we live out our faith, we begin to discover new rhythms, new patterns, new ways of living that become new tradition that we will live out and experience God's greatness. The kingdom of God is vibrant, it's dynamic, it's colorful, it's beautiful, and the right tradition gives richness to our faith. Appropriate tradition increases the depths of our faith. I want to be in line with that. I don't want to be that person that has this ill-fitting religious experience that causes me to have to wade through life in hopes that I'm good enough, in hopes that I work hard enough, in hopes that I will get to heaven merely on what I have accomplished. And I don't want to be the pastor that throws and heaps those burdens on people in an attempt to force them to do what they're supposed to do, to do what they're required to do. Don't misunderstand though, church. Jesus Christ was willing to call people out on their sinfulness, but he also helped them understand that he was bringing to He was coming to bring a new way. He was coming to bring something where we could experience life at its full as we discover, as we grow, as the vibrance of His love, as the dynamic truth 
uh, of the Scripture begins to invade our lives. We begin to discover just who He really is. And without laying something overwhelming upon ourselves, we begin to change in powerful ways. The right tradition gives richness to our faith. Appropriate tradition increases the depth of our faith. Now in that, I want to ask you a question. What if we once again allowed God to create in us His vibrant wonder, initiating a tradition that reveals to the world who He really is, rather than driving them away? I am a pastor, okay? I love what I do. But I have been in places before where I have wanted to wash myself of certain ministries because I was overwhelmed by tradition and expectation. It's not just something that happens to the people within the church. There are different ideas about how a pastor should be, what a pastor should be like, what he should look like or she should look like what it's supposed to um, what what it's supposed to be and what that's done is it it's driven people away they don't want no part of it if that's what i got to do in order to experience god and get to heaven i don't want any part of it because i tell you i'm going to leave the overwhelming reality of sin and then coming to the overwhelming reality of some burden that i've got to carry the rest of my life in hopes that i'm good enough I'm going to have to stand up on a stage like American Idol and perform before a judge and hope that my performance is good enough. When we know some of us, including myself, (laughs) don't sing good enough. It's just not enough. We're not going to perform well enough. What if we were brazen enough to break new ground? What if we were brazen enough to decide what critical um, tradition is and hold on to it, but release the things that are holding us back? What if we were to release the traditions that are opposing Christ's mission? What if we were to blaze new trails? I I know in my own um, life, New traditions, traditions that I've experienced just with my family are so exciting. When my wife and I got married, we made a statement. We will always spend Christmas together. We'll go see family at Christmas. We'll do some, or Christmas Eve, we'll do some things maybe just before or just after. But Christmas Day, that's our day. And we're not going to allow anything to interfere with that. And for a time, that was just Kelly and I until we had kids. And every Christmas, that's our day. That's our experience. Now, this last year, just, just in understanding the power of tradition, this, this plays right in. La- this last year, I had to work on Christmas. It changed. I had to go in and be with, with um, kids that were not my own. And I found joy in that because those kids don't have families to spend Christmas with. And I had an experience there that was wonderful, but I was away from my family. And I'm telling you, that was hard. That was really hard. So that's an indication that some traditions are things that we should not part with. That we should not allow um, it to be taken from us. You know, tradition should be born of the truth of who Christ, Christ is. Tradition should be born of what the Scripture says. Tradition should be born of and understanding that we have purpose in this life. Now, I, um, I don't know if you guys know who Diedrich Bonhoeffer was. He was this incredible man who was launching a church. He was facing all kinds of difficulties. In, um, he, was, he, was caught, he was experiencing all kinds of difficulties with Nazis, and um, he wrote one of the classics that we've fallen in love with, The Cost of Discipleship and Life Together. And he was born in 1906 in Germany and began his journey in the church leadership during the rise of the Nazis regime. And so he had all kinds of things. This was the rise of Hitler's power. And um, just two years later marked the turning point um, in Bonhoeffer's career. 
And so he began to do things underground. He began to do church underground. And, and um, the church grew reluctant to contradict Nazi leadership. And so ultimately, Bonhoeffer was arrested for his involvement in helping the Jews. And then in April 1945, just one month before Germany surrendered, he was killed. He was sentenced to death and hanged. Now, this was a man who understood the value of one of the most critical traditions that we have as Christians. And that tradition is community. That tradition is getting together. That tradition is spending time together, influencing each other, encouraging one another, building up people. Now, one of our traditions should be born of love, should be, should be um, compelled by love. One of the traditions that we should have as we engage the world is a tradition in understanding what God has called us to. Every single day should be a traditional experience that I'm going to wake up today and I'm going to go for it. I'm going to give all myself. He said this, God loves human beings. God loves the world. Not an ideal human, but human beings as they are. Not an ideal world, but the real world. What we find repulsive in their opposition to God, what we shrink back from with pain and hostility, this is for God, the ground of the unfathomable love. The unfathomable love. We have a critical part. We have a critical part to play in his mission. You see, tradition will narrow our view of what is possible by faith in God alone. What is tradition rooted in? My own effort. Tradition is rooted in my own attempt. Tradition is rooted in what I can do to get there. Tradition is something that makes us the ones who fight hard enough for grace and mercy. But that's not how, tra that's not how faith works. Tradition will narrow our view of what is possible by faith in God alone. But the death and resurrection and love of Christ as our center and the foundation of His Word leading our every action, we will discover a faith that notices, that takes notice of what is invisible, will believe what seems to be unbelievable and experience what is impossible or by our own understanding what is impossible. Tradition. Don't allow it to rob you of the wonder of God. Because it will. It will. When you live from a place where you try to gain His mercy and receive His love, you will never experience the fullness of life that you can when you decide to live from His mercy and from His love and from His favor. When you already have it, you are empowered to go for it. And you will learn, you will grow. The unforced rhythms of His grace will impact you every single day. And you will discover that though you were worn out, though you were um, burned out on religion, though you were tired, your life will be recovered and you will discover just how wonderful it is to be a Christian. How wonderful it is to belong to Christ. I want tradition to enrich our church. I want tradition to empower our faith. I want tradition to be a dynamic history of our faith and our movement. However, I refuse. I will do everything in my power to keep tradition from being the place that anchors us in the wrong thing to be the thing that anchors us in the wrong place, that holds us from what we could become, from who we could become. 
there is freedom. There's freedom in Christ. There is freedom in faith. If we're not careful, we will get bogged down and controlled by things that have no business controlling us. We will lose influence in the world. We will lose influence with our love because our love will come with something that they have to abide by. It will come with conditions. Jesus' love never comes with conditions. You accept it and you grow. You accept it and you change. You, you experience His love It's awesome. It's just awesome. So let's be a people that discover an unforced rhythm in life that changes us rather than forcing ourselves into certain rhythms that will distort our view of God and bring us sorrow as opposed to joy. So, church, what now? You gotta ask yourself that question. What now? What are you gonna do? Where are you gonna where, where are you gonna go from here? How are you going to experience the life that Christ has called you to? I would encourage you if because I know that I've experienced, if any of you in here have experienced the, the difficulty and the challenge of tradition, that you would come to the Lord, that you would come to Jesus and you would allow Him to alleviate that from you. That you would come to Him and He, as other translations say, He will give rest for your soul. So that you can walk with Him. That you can watch what He does. That you can discover who He is. Because why? He's not keeping it a secret. Oh, get this, church. Because too many Christians are miserable. Like we could be really happy. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for truth. We thank you for the dynamic word that we have an opportunity to read every day. God, as we read that, as we discover things, as we marvel at what you've set into motion because of your death and resurrection, Jesus, the things that you said, the things that you shared, the things that you empowered your disciples to encourage your people to begin to follow and abide by. God, the, 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 the truth that you've asked us to allow to become tradition. God, that those things would empower us. But traditionalism, the very thing that constricts life, the very thing that robs us of joy, the very thing that we will chase after and attempt to be enough for you, God, that we would shed ourselves of that and experience hope and experience confidence. And when others see that we are not confined, but we are set free, that they themselves would want to come, that they themselves would want to experience this thing we call church because it's nothing that they ever thought it was. God, help us. Bring our joy. Bring us peace. May we learn new rhythms as we allow at times the right ones, the rhythms from yesterday to set in as well.